So when we went to the Cape Canaveral Lighthouse and Space Tour, it was a group tour, so we didn't want to interfere with anybody else's tour, but it was also super, super windy that day. Yeah, so very. we thought we'd sit down with you today and kind of go over what we saw and, and how much we enjoyed it, because it really was a great tour. So we took it with Canaveral Tours, which to the best of our knowledge, that is the only tour company that has access to the Cape. So you can't just drive on, you can only get onto the base if you have working access. Um, so you have to take a tour. So your first stop on the tour is at Launch Complex 9. Um, it was built for the Navajo Supersonic Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. Oh, that's, a, that's really a big uh, mouthful to say. Uh, the program was scrapped after eight of 11 launches failed. Um, but you will, they, they walk you around the complex. It's amazing. Um, it now has more of a somber uh, uh, purpose. It's the abandoned missile silos out there is where they, uh, what would you say, buried. It's where they put all the Challenger debris and then sealed it forever. So you see the mounds out there and it, you know, it really, really uh, reminds you of the, the cost that goes into uh, space exploration. So... These mounds right here, um, they're put out there. And what they are is they're bunkers that you go into when, if there's a catastrophic failure of the mission. So the next stop is the lighthouse itself. Um, it's the only fully operational lighthouse owned by the US Space Force. Uh, and it's the oldest standing structure on the Cape. Um, it was first established in 1848 and the current lighthouse uh, was completed in 1868. Um, they have great things. This house right here is a reconstruction of what the keeper's house would have been. The lighthouse itself uh, is cast iron. It was made and then made in pieces and assembled actually on site. And it was made to be disassembled so if they needed to move it back for seas and shoreline shifting and such. So on the third floor was all of the living quarters. Um, they had kitchens, they had bedrooms, they had everything. Um, they, cause they, before they built the keeper's quarters, they actually lived in the lighthouse itself. Right here is a depiction of what the dining, dining area would have been. Right here, this vent in the floor was to allow cool air to circulate through the floors. Cause you can imagine how hot it would be in Florida with, uh, the heat and humidity. Uh, and a cast iron lighthouse. Check out the curvature of the doors though. I thought that was really interesting. Um, these steps would lead you up to the top. Uh, the keepers would climb it every day to take care of the lights. This right here explains how the Fresnel lens is. It looks like Fresnel, but it's actually pronounced Fresnel. Um, how it would take the light and direct it from scattering everywhere into one solid beam of light. And each lighthouse has its own unique light signature, whether that's through blinking, whether that's on, off, all of that, plus the actual, the painting on the outside. Um, that helps mariners know the location just by the pattern of the lights blinking and the pattern on the, uh, that's painted. Right next to the uh, lighthouse is Hangar C, which is the oldest missile assembly on the Cape and has around 30 rocket and missile uh, restorations inside as you can see so nearly every type of Air Force long-range guided missile uh, was built here between 1953 and 1956 and this is also a good reminder this was a good reminder for us anyways to speak with the docents that are there the docents are typically mm -hmm. especially around Cape Canaveral and and Kennedy are typically retired NASA workers and we spoke with the docent that was the engineer for some of these rockets. So yeah. if you're very interested in the details, you can't get any more detail than speaking <laughs> with the engineer who made them. Yeah, it was, it's <laughs> funny. I, he was telling me about some of them, and he said I used to work on these. And because I come from a maintenance background, that's just where my head goes. So I said, oh, you were a, you were a mechanic? He goes, no, I was a rocket scientist. I built these. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, uh, Werner Von Braun and his team were the first to use Hangar C. Um, he had an office on the second floor. The examples and the restorations are, are just amazing. 
Here's a Jupiter rocket. The redstone, the, re the Mercury redstone, these were the ones that were uh, used to send Alan Shepard and the very first astronauts up into suborbit and orbit. This was an interesting one. The, yeah, the tactical nuke trailer. And then this was the long range cameras where they, when they're blasting something off and they follow it into space, basically, these are the long range cameras. Here's some Apollo and Mercury boilerplates from Gemini. A lot of history in Hangar C. A lot of history really throughout the Cape. There are so many small places to get off and, you know, whether it's the Sands Space Center or American Space Center in Titusville, you know, there's, there's a lot of history. If you're interested in space, it's not just about Kennedy Space Center. Your next and last stop will be Launch Complex 26 and Launch Complexes 5 and 6. Um, this, these were working blockhouses in the very early days of our manned space program. Um, and while set in Cocoa Beach, uh, you might be surprised, or maybe not, to know that I Dream of Genie, nothing was ever actually filmed in Cocoa Beach. That was just the setting for the show. Here are the, uh, the monkey knots and the astro chimps. Um, they paved the way for man's eventual trips. This was the actual uh, seat and capsule that they sat in and would have various tasks they needed to do. This was my favorite room. <laughs> this room was amazing. This is, uh, this is a launch room. This, uh, with all the analog, uh, long before computers, everything, this was actually what would launch uh, the, the Mercury Redstones with Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom and all of them aboard. I can only imagine how loud it was with all those reels spinning, all those switches yeah. going. <laughs> I can also imagine just how much smoke was in there. Back then, yeah. <laughs> there wasn't the rule of no smoking in government buildings and no smoking in it. Everybody smoked. You know, and they, I mean, I don't know how many people they packed in, but almost every piece of equipment needed someone at it. So there probably would have been, what, dozens of people in there. And this glass, how thick this glass was. It's amazing to think that all of this equipment in this room probably doesn't even equal the amount of power and computing power that we have in our cell phone that we carry in our pocket every day. This is where the launch director would sit. This scale, was the, the rocket itself set on a scale and they had this inside because everything came down to the amount of weight. Uh, again, there's the ashtray. Uh, <laughs> but the amount of weight for fuel and for everything, so everything was precise down to how much it weighed to get into space. Here's a replica of the Mercury Redstone rocket, Liberty 7, that Alan Shepard rode into space. Here's some mock-ups of Werner uh, Von Braun's early uh, prototypes and all that as he learned about, about propulsion. This is a great example uh, and exhibit for the United States Space Force, which as you might know is our newest branch of the military. Here's an unmanned mock-up of the uh, capsule that they sent up with just electronics in there so that they could learn the heat and everything like that that would experience. A lot of satellites and uh, models of them. So regardless of where you choose to spend your time when you're on the Space Coast, whether it's Kennedy Space Center, uh, American Space Museum in Titusville, Sand Space Center, which is just outside the gates of Cape Canaveral and actually free, um, or this tour. We've done videos on all of these, all of those, I think. I believe so, yeah. And um, they're all very different in the, in the, what you'll see. Mm -hmm. And I think all worth the stop, especially if you're into space. And I think we need to get excited about space exploration again. I think that kind of went away when so many witnessed Challenger Live. You know, when I was in grade school, they used to wheel in the TV for every launch, and we watched every launch and learned about those different things. And that's just not happening anymore. And well, every launch is like every day now. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> you know, 
even even just the space exploration side of it alone, it leads to so much that we have going on here from medical treatments to everything really. We're learning because of the space exploration. So it really deserves our excitement. It really is exciting. I mean, my God, to watch one of those go up in the air is, is always amazing, no matter how many times you watch it. <laughs> so so uh, definitely give the Space Coast a stop. Yeah. And let us know if you see us on the road. Next week, we'll have a, another video coming out on Marjorie Rawlings and the yearling. She wrote the yearling, and we visited her home and the restaurant, the yearling, and it was a very interesting tour itself. We'll see you next week and hopefully on the road sometime. <laughs>